Hi, my name is Paul Grogan, and welcome to episode 58 of the Gaming Rules podcast. In this episode, I'm joined by Ben Maddox, and we're talking about some of the games that we've been playing, just for a change, and also I've got a couple of topics of discussion that I wanted to chat to Ben about to see what he thought about them, and I'm also keen to find out what you think about them. So, over on my BGG Guild, which is Guild number 2258, I'm going to start a discussion thread on there, and if you're interested in either of the topics of discussion and you want to give us your thoughts, then head on over to the Guild and join in the discussion on there. The Gaming Rules podcast is sponsored by Gameslaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer over at gameslaw.com. And this podcast has been made possible due to my Patreon. So if you are listening to this podcast and you are interested in supporting me on Patreon, then please check out the Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash gaming rules. And now on with the show. So yes, yeah, so welcome back to the show, Ben. Hello. Really, Paul, you've done up the uh, Gaming Rules Towers incredibly. That new mud wrestling hall that you <laughs> developed is astonishing. Well, since you were last here, I got your letter of recommendation saying I should get a mud wrestling hall installed. Well, well, and that's it. And, and it's just clear you're making all the money now because, oh, yeah. you know... I know that there's a lot of money in board gaming and you're making most of it, it seems. Very soon I'll have enough to buy out Asmodee. So that, that's how much money I'm making at the moment. I've got £97.23. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure once I get to £100 they'll sell. So That's about, that's that's double the cost of any other board game company. So exactly. I, I shouldn't exactly. think you'll have an issue. Yeah. So anyway, well, welcome back to the show. Now, I invited you back on the show because I enjoyed having you on last time. And... For this podcast, I wanted to do something a little different. Rather than just talking about the games that we've played, which is what I do in pretty much every other one, I wanted to have a couple of discussions about some key topics. Is this because I'm overly opinionated, Paul? Is this it? Um, let's just say that when I have heard you on other podcasts discussing things, yeah. I enjoyed listening to those discussions. So I thought, I want a part of that. I want, I want you in on it. Enjoyed or endured? <laughs> yeah, well, somebody did strap me down to the chair and force me to listen to it, but, you know, that, that, that's a service that I pay for, um, so we won't go into that. And Clockwork Orange was based on that experience? Yes, yes. Now, before we start, um, you used to do, you used to co-host a show called Perfect Information. I did indeed. Which I used to listen to. Now, that, that has since moved on. Perfect Information is no more. But you've now got a new thing. So tell people about your new thing. I have. And if anyone accuses me of, let's say, plagiarising a famous Sunday BBC Radio 4 show, I will see them in court. But this, ga <laughs> this podcast is called Five Games for Doomsday. And what it is, is I interview notable board game people and the premise is, is there's been a nuclear apocalypse or something like that, and they've had to flee to a cabin in the woods. Mm -hmm. And they're only allowed to take five games with them. And I use that as a flimsy pretext to get them to divulge personal stuff about themselves. Right. Okay. One show has gone out live with Gil Hover. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't live. I recorded it. I edited out all Sorry, of my no. boring bits. But yes, one, one episode is on the internet now and that's with Gil Hover, designer yep. of the networks, owner of Formal Ferret Games and co-host of Ludology and he was gracious enough, I asked him and he said yes and then he did an incredible amount of work, wrote me a really detailed bio, gave nice. me a list of the five games telling me exactly why he'd chosen them and he was an absolute joy and I've, I've interviewed some other people, I've got some other people coming up that most people will know but the show is not just a top five, your favourite games. Most people have been really good sports and mm -hmm. bought into the concept. Okay. And so they don't choose their favourite games. They choose games that they would take on an apocalypse. And whether that's practical because it's very replayable or whether it's sentimental, something that they could just look at on the shelf and wistfully remember these wonderful days of late capitalism, you know. Interesting, interesting. So the normal podcast... Um, format, which is what this one is, you know, talk about the games we've been playing and then talk about stuff. That's not it. That's not what your show is. No, I want to know who the people are, what formed them as gamers, and, you know, most of the people have something, well, all of them work within the gaming industry, whether that be media, whether that be publishing, whether that be designing. Excellent. Right, so that's five games to Doomsday, available on iTunes, Stitcher, websites. Yeah, five games for doom five games for doomsday.com. That's all words. 
And yep. then five games for Doomsday on Twitter. That's five, the number games for the number doomsday on twitter uh yeah itunes you can find it it's all words stitcher all of that sort of stuff and it releases on a bi-weekly basis right see i never understand bi-weekly is that every other week or twice a week no that's every two weeks fortnightly paul for our british listeners (laughs) what would twice a week be called twice Twice weekly (laughs) right anyway right so we've plugged your stuff Let's talk about some of the games that we've been playing. I'm going to go first. Quite frankly, we haven't plugged it enough. I mean, I could go on for the next 45 (laughs) minutes, but you're the boss. You do that. I'll edit it all out. Right. Excellent. So, games that we've been playing. Uh, I played a little filler game at my local games club before before the rest of the games kicked off, which was Cockroach Poker. So, how... How much did you detest it on a scale of 1 to 10? 1 being, oh, I just hated it. 10 being, I want to kill whoever designed this game. Let, let, let me take you on a journey. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> so the player, who recommend, uh, the player who was suggesting it, a friend of mine, Mark, he was kind of like, oh, come and play this. And then he was like, you don't have to play it if you don't want. It's like he knew that I was going to hate it. Right? right. And he was like, oh, maybe you don't want to play this. But I really, really like Perudo. Okay? okay. I've just... And, I, and I'm terrible at bluffing games. You're so, your social deduction games, your werewolves and stuff like that, I'm terrible at them. But Perudo, I really, really like. And the bluffing element in Perudo, I, I, I really like as well. Um, and this game was sort of compared to that. So we played it. Yeah. And we started playing it and I absolutely hated it. Except it got better at the end. And here's the reason why. So... In Cockroach Poker, and for those people who don't know, basically you've got a hand of cards, and these are these cards are like insects, they're flies and cockroaches and mosquitoes or whatever, right? And the boring and, bug and the oh my yeah. god, if I have to play this game for longer than a minute, I'm going to shoot myself in the face, mosquito. That's it, yeah, that's the one. That's its full name. And what you do is you pick you pick one of the cards and you put it face down in front of another player and you say, That's a fly, that is. And then they have to tell you whether you were lying or not and if you were lying you keep the card and if you weren't lying they keep the card and basically if you get four of the same type of card in front of you you lose that's essentially the game right now the problem that i had with the game is at the very start of the game when everybody's sat there and everybody's got cards in the hand and i give you a card and that says and i say this is a fly you are literally just a 50 50 guess as to whether i'm lying or not you have almost zero information to go off sure you've right. got the cards in your hand so you know how many types there are but you've got nothing to go off now as the game goes on for the first you know you, you you've got the first i don't know six or 12 people giving each other cards and randomly guessing were you lying or not once everybody has got cards in front of them then it becomes a game because now if you've got two flies in front of you and I give you another card and I go that's a fly that is suddenly the decisions actually become interesting and meaningful and at that point the game was okay it's not a game that I would choose to play because I'm not really into that kind of thing but my point is and it wasn't just me that was making this point two of the other players at the start of the game were like what literally we just guesses whether they're lying or not and and that's it and so it's basically pick a random card from your hand put it down on the table and then the other person just says yes or no randomly there there wasn't even a game in there until there were some cards on the table face up and at that point it became a game yeah and that was the problem for it with me I played it sort of two or three years ago and I just remember thinking this isn't a game there are no decisions to be made and you know I'd I played Cockroach Poker after playing Skull and Roses, right? And Skull and Which Roses is, is amazing. Yeah. And it's really constructed brilliantly. There's always tension in the game. Yeah. And then right I played this and I yeah. thought, this is a really poor cousin that just doesn't implement this are they, aren't they mechanism at all well. And I, I was bored to hell with it. I played two hands and went, I never want yeah. to play this again. Well, shortly afterwards, I came up with a house rule. So me and house rules which are becoming famous. I don't know if you know, but I don't know if you saw my tweet the other day, but Groganize is now in the Urban Dictionary. Okay. 
<laughs> and it means... Is this true? It really is in the Urban Dictionary. Yeah, it really is in the Urban Dictionary. Um, basically, there was a, there's a whole big discussion on a Facebook group about following on from my review that I did of Newsfjord, mm. where I suggested a house rule, is a number of people liked that house rule. And then people have said, oh, didn't Paul come up with a house rule for Pillars of the Earth a few years ago that reduced the random element and made it a little bit more strategic? Oh, and didn't he come up with a house rule for this? So a few of them decided, so it was one guy in particular who went, I'm going to add this to Urban Dictionary. And he did. So I was away at City of Games when all of a sudden I got this message to say, oh, yeah, Groganize is now in the Urban Dictionary. And it basically means to house rule a game in order to reduce the look element and improve a little bit of the skill. Anyway, right, so my, my house rule for Cockroach Poker, if you ever play it again or you're ever forced to play it again, deal the cards out at random at the start of the game and then everybody shuffles their own cards and puts three of them face up on the table in front of them and then you play. Right. And that's it. So it's basically removing the first part of the game which is completely pointless and random and not even a game and actually skip into the bit that makes it interesting. So you're suggesting, your house rule is suggesting what would have happened had the people who published the game play-tested the bloody thing? Well, no, to be fair, this is just me that thinks this. There are other people that think, oh no, the start of Cockroach Poker is important because it's like that bit in, in poker where you're learning people's tells. And what I'm doing is I'm removing that part of the game. Absolute tosh. All of this thing about knowing people's tells. I mean, there's no way you're going to learn people's tells over a game of cockroach poker. It's just a boring <laughs> game. It's just not going to happen. I know. So anyway, that was cockroach poker. Played once, probably never again. But if I did, I would, I would want to use this, this house rule. Right. What have you been playing? So I'm going to go back to a game I felt a little bit of pressure playing because oh, I've been right. talking about this game being my favourite game for about a year and a half now and I haven't played it for sort of six months. Right. And so when you're telling people that this is your favourite game and then you come to play it after six months, you're worried... Is it that, still your favourite Yeah, game? that your judgement was completely off. <laughs> and thankfully... It wasn't. Thankfully, okay. you know, my brain hasn't been addled with age yet and I'm still correct. And this is Lewis and Clark. Right. And it's just absolutely astonishing, this game. So this is your favourite game? I, I would say at this point it is, yeah. Okay, I, I, I didn't know that. I think partly because I'm good at it. Right, okay. And that really helps enjoy a game. In, in the same way as when I played Guilds of London, I, I started playing it and I just thought, I know what to do here. Okay. It was... And, and then the battle, it came to be a battle against myself to optimise how good I was, which I really enjoy, because I'm not, I'm not big on fighting with people. And, but the game just flows so beautifully. It's okay. so intuitive and it's so rewarding and it has just that little bit of interaction with looking at other people's resources and knowing when to play cards to optimise what the other person's playing. And it is just... Absolutely joyful, probably slap bang in the middle of the weight of games that are right in my sweet spot. And yeah, I played it again, two player. I've played it in every player count and in every player okay. count. It's just fabulous. And if you have not played Lewis and Clark yet, do it. I have played it a couple of times, um, close to when it came out. I think the first time we played with wrong rules. Uh, yeah, maybe I've played it three times. The first thing that surprised me about Lewis and Clark is it was heavier than I was expecting. Based on the social media buzz that it was getting at the time when it came out, I was expecting it to be a sort of light to medium game. And then I got it and I was like, oh, actually, no, this is this is quite thinky, this. Um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing because that, you know, medium to heavy is, in, is, is right in my wheelhouse. But right. that was just a bit of a surprise. Wasn't there a problem with the rules when the game first came out and they, they had to fix it? with something I have about absolute, going back? I have absolutely no idea. I yeah. bought the German version. I assume it had, would have been fixed by the time the German version came out because I've Probably. seen no issue with it. Yeah. There, there was something about moving back on the river and setting up... I, I can't remember exactly, but it was, a, it was an exploit in the game that was one of those counterintuitive to what you should be doing so most players don't do it, but then if you do do it, it kind of breaks things a bit. I was just really happy to get the game out again and to be reassured, especially because I had one of those sort of 
uh, celebrity moments. And I, I mean, <laughs> I don't really consider board gamey people celebrities particularly. But when I met Cedric Chabouci, because mm-hmm. I love the game so much, I was I was a little bit, oh, hello. And we've subsequently become friends. I mean, the kind of friends that meet at Essen and have a beer, yes. you know, but, but nevertheless. And so I'm... I'm really happy that I still love his game. Good. And, yeah, anyone, play Lewis and Clark. It's astonishing. Have you played Discoveries? I haven't. Right. I have. Uh, I did a review of it a uh, year, year and a half ago. Um, and it was the... Because I, I, did, I did the standard review. Here's the bits I like. Here's the bits I don't like. Whatever. And there was nothing about the game that I didn't like. It was, right. It was really weird. It was one of those reviews where I was like, look... I really want to try and find something about this game that I don't like, but I just couldn't find anything about it at all. Um, I'm not saying it's like the best game ever, but when I start to pick faults in games, which I, I do all the time, I couldn't find one with it. Um, but it's very different. You know, it isn't Lewis and Clark light. It's Lewis and Clark themed, but it's a completely different game. But it is a lighter game. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's surprising, and I, I was speaking to Cedric that... Lewis and Clark still sells reasonably, whereas yeah. Discoveries sort of had a peak when it first came out and then sort of completely fell off. Right. And really doesn't sell anymore, which surprises me. I mean, I haven't played it, partly because I, I, I kind of don't want anything to sully my experience right. of Lewis and Clark. You okay. know, but a lot of people say it's just absolutely wonderful, and it mechanically sounds really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm surprised that it isn't as any more popular than it is. So that's Lewis and Clark. Right, the next thing that we played after Cockroach Poker, was Sidereal Confluence, which loads of people have been talking about. Um, And a few people at my local club were very keen to try it. I was very keen to try it, because lots and lots of people had been posting about it, and it was supposed to be really good. So this this is a space game with massively asymmetric powers that takes up to nine players, and apparently doesn't really work if you have fewer than five. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to play it. I played it once at Essen. I was completely full of fever, and we played it for the first time with eight people, <gasps> and mo- <laughs> half of them were drunk. I was almost dead, right? And I detested it, right? <laughs> and the f- the friend I who bought it at Essen and I played it with that night has subsequently played it and said, "Yeah, you need to play this again because it's actually great." Yeah, but we just played it in completely the wrong conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny how you know the conditions and the other people around you can affect your experience so much that it reflects badly on the game itself. Um, well, I don't know if Chris the Rocket Surgeon listens to this, but it's absolutely his fault. It's his fault. That the game went downhill because right. he's an awful person. Right, okay. Well, I'm glad we've cleared that up. I'll, I'll make sure he listens to it. So, Sidereal Confluence. At the end of the game, because it, it, it was an interesting experience, um, Paul, a friend of mine who was teaching it, wasn't comfortable teaching it and he'd lost us five minutes in. Two of the, well, three of us who were trying to listen to the rules literally just had no idea at all what we were doing. So the teach wasn't particularly great. And then the problem is it kind of went downhill from there. What we should have done is we should have waited till the end of the ruler's explanation and gone, tell you what, let's not do this. Let, let, just forget it. Let, let's go on. To That's what we should have done with hindsight because it was a terrible night, um, you know, for, for everybody involved. Even the people who were playing the game who enjoyed it didn't have a good night because the social, we're all still friends. Nobody fell out with each other. But the atmosphere that was there, you know, two of the players literally were just getting angry and shouting because they had no idea what they were doing and giving up. And we talked about stopping play halfway through. It was an awful experience. At the end of it, I was like, this game is genius. This game mm. is the, the amount of, assuming it's balanced, the amount of effort and detail in that game, because the asymmetric powers are just vastly different. Um, and I love the open trading and I love the resource conversion and everything. there's so much about this game to like it but I mean in terms of rules it's probably medium to heavy probably even medium rules wise mm. but then when you actually play it especially with that many players you're like oh my god there is so much going on if you only had your own stuff to worry about it would be okay but the fact that you can use other people's cards you know you can borrow that card off them for a turn 
means you pretty much have to be aware of everything that's going on at the table, which is impossible with that many people. I think it's one of those games whereby you need to play it a number of times to really unlock the enjoyment in it. And the problem is, how often do you get how the often time do you do to it? say, you know, I'm going to play this four times and by the fifth time it's going to be brilliant, but I have to really put that yeah. investment of time in. I mean, I will play it again and fingers crossed... I love it Chris. because I, I saw when I played it that this has the potential to be really cool yeah. and really interactive and sort of pure negotiation. Yeah. But at the time, I just thought this is discombobulating. This is too complex. There's too many things going on. There are too many inputs and too many outputs. Yeah. And quite frankly, I'm going to shoot everyone oh, at this bloody table. Oh, there was so table. many. There was like... I mean, I probably had like nine or ten cards in front of me and I was like, oh, right, so I can put that into there that gets this and that into there. And so many different cubes of different... There, there was... You know, I, I think if that game was... Had 25% or 40% chopped out of it, it would still be the same game. It would just be a lot less overhead in the rules. It seems to me that it's a symptom of sort of modern gaming in a good way, in that I think the sidereal confluence and colonists sort of are similar in ways. Not in gameplay or anything mm -hmm. like that, but it's sort of new designers coming into the hobby and saying, why can't I make a six-hour epic right. resource conversion Euro game? Why the hell not? <laughs> you know, and this new... And why can't I make this absolutely insane negotiation game yeah. where there's loads and loads of different powers that interact off each other. And I don't know how they're going to turn out, but frankly, who cares? Yeah. And it, it feels like new energetic people bringing these wonderful ideas into gaming. And I think Sidereal Confluence and Colonists are both very brave, very, very interesting games. Yeah. I mean, Colonist, when it came out and people were like, oh yeah, yeah, you play it, it's like six hours or eight hours. I'm like, people don't make games like that anymore. Right. It, it, it's odd. Now, Sidereal Confluence probably for us would have been about two and a half hours if we didn't keep stopping and shouting at each other and deciding mm. whether to carry on playing or not. It's not an overly long game. There's just there's just so much going on. So here's an interesting... It's just, it's just bonkers, yeah. Yeah, here's an interesting story for you. I've been wanting to design my own game for about 25 years, right? Mm. And I was getting, in my life, I was getting more and more and more frustrated with the fact that I haven't done this and all yeah. I can do this... And eventually, about five years ago, maybe six years ago, something like that, I said, right, in order to get this monkey off my back, I am going to pick one of my ideas and I'm going to see it through to completion and I'm going to make a playable game. Whether it's right. good or not, it doesn't matter because all of my other things are just scribbled notes on bits of paper, right? And I said, right, I'm, I'm going to do one. And I spent about a year and a half on it, maybe two years, it had various changes of theme, it had lots of different changes, it had new mechanics thrown in, it was, you know, it went through development and streamlining and everything else. Thoroughly groganized. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, no, there was no house rules for it because, you know... <laughs> well, they, <laughs> no, were, they were done in your they house. They were done in so my house, that's true. They're the ultimate Paul Grogan house rule. So I did it and I got it to a stage where I thought, look, right, it's done. This game is now playable. It's not suitable for publication. That would have required lots more effort, but it is playable as it is. And I spoke to WizKids about it because I was working with WizKids on the Mage Knight stuff and I got to know mm. one of the guys who worked at WizKids. And I sent him a rough draft of the rules and he said, oh, okay, I've spoken to the others. We're interested in this. We will retheme it to fit one of our IPs because they have lots of, you know, IPs, the, the Lord of the Rings and they have Marvel and, you know, they have all of that stuff. Um, and we'll pay you a fixed sum of money for this design and then you mm. you hand it over to us and, and we'll do it and i said no thank you very much I, that's not wow. what i'm looking for i'm looking for being involved in the process myself rather than just handing it over right so that was it um anyway my game had um open negotiation uh resource trading exactly like sidereal confluence using each other's buildings exactly like sidereal confluence now, I'm not suggesting in any way that they stole my idea because, you know, obviously the designer of Sidereal Confluence designed it himself. It's just a big coincidence that, that the trading part of Sidereal Confluence, that's exactly what I designed. And it's just, yeah. you know, it's just strange how that, that sort of happens. Um, you know, the people who played my game will, will remember it from 
you know, years ago and go, oh, yeah. So you're telling me you're going to sue WizKids, is that uh, Basically, you're yeah. I, I, nice. I've already written the letter. And uh, as I say, well, what I'm going to do is once I've got my £100, I'll buy Asmodee, and then Asmodee will buy NECA, who, and that, I'll get my own bike that way. So just by just by owning it. Yeah, just basically. Yeah. Right, back to you. And then publish Groganize 9000. <laughs> <laughs> so, I went through a lot of my gaming career having not played a splotter game. Right. And I really regret it because I've played 3 now and okay. each one just surprised me at how interesting, original, and seemingly flowing down a different stream than to all the other sort of designs. That's not to say mainstream designs or other sort of designs are bad, but splotter games are just so unique and interesting and do things that I've never seen. And I played Antiquity. Okay, one of their earlier ones. Yeah, and it's just astonishing. But one thing Antiquity does show is how Euro games have changed in the last 10 to 15 years. Yes. In how much tougher on the players the games are, right? And if you're not on your metal, the game will really punish you. Mm -hmm. And Euro games have become more and more like Skinner boxes, I think, as we've gone on, in that they're very much, you know, you press a button, you get something. You press a button, you get something. Yeah. Whereas... And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Games are there to be enjoyed. It's recreation time, of course. But sometimes it is nice to have to really work and plan and make sure you're meticulous and precise. And that's what antiquity really gives you. And Mm -hmm. it was, you know, it blew my mind. Right. You played the new version? Yeah. A friend of mine bought it at Essen, and just now we managed to crack it out. Right. See, I played it when it first came out. I remember the Essen when it came out. And we were all there, and we saw the booth, and we were like, what the heck's this? You know, the game comes Mm. with, like, a thousand counters or something ridiculous, you know. And it was just, it was like, they don't make games like that anymore. And there they were with it, and I was like, this is insane. So, and it was like £100 at the time, because they'd only made a few copies. But one of our group, we just had to buy it, because it was so weird and different. And then we played it a few times, um, and then it kind of, we weren't really bothered about it after that. Um, it was it was okay, but it was very fiddly. And it was... A lot of things would have been... Um, it was kind of like playing a computer game, but using lots of little chits. And I'm more of yeah, a board gamer than a, than a computer game person, but the fiddliness and the admin side of things was a little too much. Now, I don't know if they've changed the game hugely Don't think so. since it was first published to this new edition. But I didn't find any of that. I found all of the actions I were doing tied together okay. and were all interesting. And I've played now, I've played three of their games now. I've played Food Chain Magnet, Indonesia, and yep. Antiquity. And just all of them strike me, what they strike me as, the splotter guys, are just on unapologetically them. Yeah. They make games, and they both work in different professions, and they said I spoke to one of the guys, and he told me, you know, this is essentially a hobby. So they kind of don't care. And so they don't have considerations of profitability and worthiness for the market and all of this. They just go, we'll make this crazy thing, and if you like it, all the better. And And you can see that written all over their games, and they really adore that. Yeah. For sure, and I'm definitely one of yeah. them. Yeah, I mean, they, they've done quite a few games. They're, they're all different, but one of the things that I find very similar with all of the Splotter games, that I certainly that I've played, is, and this applies to Antiquity and Food Chain Magnet, is you can basically write a plan of what you need to do for the next 10 turns. There was a guy, it was the guy who bought Antiquity, Chinese guy who used to come with us to Essen every year and he went away and he analysed every different aspect of antiquity and basically wrote a step-by-step guide of how you win in 17 turns. Now, at that point, you're not playing a game anymore. You are literally just following like a walkthrough on a computer game and going, oh, go here, now do this, now do that. Right. But he was absolutely right. He'd, he'd analysed the game and he'd written it all down to such a point that it was like, if you do this, 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 you'll win in 17 turns. And he proved that one of the 
you build a church at some point, don't you? And that decides your yeah. victory condition. One of them, That's right. you win in 17 turns and none of the other ones can do that. And Food Chain Magnet has a similar thing. Once you get really, really good at it, there are these optimum strategies and literally you have to follow step by step and not veer from the path on that strategy. And their games well, I mean, I, lend themselves to that. I mean, thankfully, I'm a magpie and I go off to the next shiny thing. And yeah. once I come back to the game, I've completely forgotten. So <laughs> I, I never get to the point where that's ever going to be an issue I don't for either. me. I don't either. And I can completely understand people being concerned by that, but it's never going to be a concern of mine. No. Because, I mean, especially Antiquity takes a long time to play as well. I'm not going to play it every week. Yeah. No, I mean, the parts of Antiquity that I really like, as I say, it's been 10 years since I played it. But, you know, you go and chop down the trees and that adds pollution and things like that, you know, as I say, if that was a computer game, that's the kind of computer game that I would play at home. You know, you're, 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 you're farming these resources and it's polluting. And, and once you do stuff in your city, don't you produce junk that you have to then dump somewhere? Yeah, exactly. There's things like that, unless you build a certain building, That's which it. takes the refuse away. And then there are the dead bodies starvation take and up death. space in your city. Exactly. It's um, it, it's punishing as all hell, but just loads of fun. Yeah. It, I mean, incredible. I was, again, every game I play of theirs just wows me with how refreshing and original they are. Right. Cool. So we've both talked about two of the games we've been playing. We have played more, but I want to move on to the discussion topics. Indeed. So the first one is Take That in Games. And... This is inspired by recent discussions about the game Merlin. I don't know if you've played Merlin. I haven't played Merlin right. yet, and I hear, I hear varied reports. Yeah, so Merlin, when it came out, it's, it's Stefan Feld and Michael Reinek. Um, I'm a massive Stefan Feld fan, and Michael Reinek did Pillars of the Earth, so this was very, very high on my list of ones to try. Right. And then when it came out, about 90% of people that I spoke to about it, which is, to be fair, about 20 people... All was like, eh, it's not very good. And th- have you have you heard of this concept of a talent bomb? No. It's it's a concept in film. So what you do is you get a cast of George Clooney and Brad Pitt and Matt Damon and Jessica Chastain, and you get a director like P.T. Anderson, and then you get a writer like Dave Eggers, and they all come together on this project, and it's going to be amazing. And there's something about the combination of all these wonderful people together that creates absolute refuse. <laughs> so I'm always a little... Okay. A little suspicious when I see sort of superstar people yeah. getting together. You yeah. Know? So, yeah, as I say, most people I'd heard said it was meh. So I went into the game expecting it to be meh and really enjoyed it. I've played it twice since and I really enjoy it. Now, one of the aspects of the game is some people, friends of mine, feel that the take that element is way too high and completely ruins the entire game. And I was like... Oh, wow, because I don't really feel that there's a take that element in there, which is, as I say, this is what inspires this this discussion. So take that, for those people listening who don't know what we're talking about, we're not talking about the band from the 90s. If you were listening to this podcast for the Mark Owen discussion, then I'm sorry, this isn't it. But take that in games is where you do something which hurts another player. And Mm. as a Euro gamer... I don't play games that have take that in them, really. How about you, Ben? Well, I do. I play all kinds of games. Right. I, I hesitate to say I'm an omni gamer because I, I mean, if I have my choice, it's Euro games, yeah. medium to heavy Euro games, I guess. But I think it's a problem of advertising. Okay. If you if you have a game that's clearly take that, if it's a combat game or something like, so one of the sort of one of my favourite games, and a game that is essentially just a take that game, is Blood Bowl Team Manager. Right. And it's got Blood Bowl theming, it's about going in and tackling and killing people. So you expect it. So Cutthroat Caverns is another great example, right? You go into that game expecting take that. And these games are for more than two players, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, And so... I mean, there is a there is a problem with being victimised, right? About yeah. feeling that everyone's ganging up on yeah. me. But I think if the game screams take that to you, then you're not disappointed when it is take that right. because you expect it. When it comes in a 
nice Euro package with a stern man on the cover pointing at a castle being built uh, or, or something okay. like, I, I mean, I, I almost flipped the table when I played Terraforming Mars. Right. Because they've got those cards where you could just decimate a person's yeah, yeah, turn. Yeah. And it seems like such an unnecessary bolt-on. And it, I felt cheated. Yeah. I, and so, yeah, you've got, to, you've got to expect it to come. And if it's not advertised and you're surprised by it, I think that's when people become miffed. Yeah. So, so for me, um, you know, a, a, a definite take that is I play a card that literally says, you lose something, right? And, and my entire right. reason for playing that card is to hurt you and it does really nothing for me, Okay. That is, for me, the, 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 the purest definition of take that. Now, if we're playing a two-player game, I have right. no problem with take that at all. So all of my conversations about take that are not for two-player games. They are for games where you're playing with more than two players, and I am deliberately targeting another player to hurt them. Right. Now, and I, and I generally yeah. don't, don't play games with that in there. Now, the take that in Merlin is... There is a part of the game where you can place one of your workers on a space on the board. And when you do that, if another player has a worker on that space, they are returned back to them. Now, is that take that or not? So you can bump workers from spaces? E effectively, yeah. So, so you, you go to a space and you do the ability of that space and you leave the worker yeah. there. So you, you've got the bonus. I then come along, I bump your worker off and I then use the space. I don't see how that's. I don't see how that's take that. Okay. Now the the bit I've missed is at the end of the round you will score. You slap someone around the face. You, yeah. Yeah. As well as that, at the end of the round you will score one point for each of your workers on the board. So by me bumping you off, I you have effectively cost you one point at the end of that round. And there's no way to replace workers that have been bumped. You will have to then use one of your other actions to place that worker. On a space again. The point is, every time I've played the game and the people who I've played the game with, I went to that space with my worker of that type because that's the space I wanted to go to. And I wanted to get the thing that was on that space. The fact that you were there and you got kicked off and therefore you're going to get one point less at the end of the round is a side effect. It's a nice side effect because I'm costing another player a point. But I did not go there just to bump you off and cost you one point. I went there to do the thing that I wanted to do. Well, the question is, is it a zero-sum game? So the question it's is, if you, bump, if you bump that person, mm -hmm. are they not then able to rescue that situation? Because that's take that, and that's also malicious, and I can understand why people would get annoyed by that. But if the person has an option then to rescue themselves from that situation, there's an element of take that to it, but that is you are then being presented with further decisions, yes. which is rewarding, yeah. though. I think, I mean, I've given you a very cut-down version of the story because y y there's basically the six rounds and you get to do four actions in a round and it would be one of your actions to place that worker on a space. Right. But the one point at the end of each round, so, so worst-case situation, right, I put my worker in the first round of the game on a space... And it stays there for the whole game. It never does anything else for the whole game, but it generates me one point at the end of each round. So that right. placing that worker on that space has effectively, by the end of the game, has earned me six points, right? Hmm. If, however, on round one of the game, I went there and I used the space, and then you came along and used the space and bumped me off, and then I just never got round to spending an action to put it back on the board, I'm six points down. So Well, it depends, it depends on point distribution, right? Yeah. How many points do you score in a game? 100 and a bit, maybe? 90-something? Yeah, 90. Well, then, high, high 90s was the winning score, I think. Then whinging is completely by the by. If it's like Glass Road <laughs> and you score between 20. 15 and 30 points in a game, yeah. right, then that's understandable. That's, that's a real kick in the teeth. Yeah. But this? No. I mean, you're essentially... Those points are essentially baked in tiebreakers, right? Yeah. So, no, I don't see why you should get severely knocked off by that and especially after the first round you kind of expect that's going to happen and in a lot of games part of the game is preventing the other players doing their optimum strategy right mm -hmm. that's also fun and that's not take that that's just 
trying to get into the head of another player, yeah. which is incredibly rewarding and incredibly good fun. So what games have you played that have an element of take that, similar to Merlin, that you don't have a problem with? Well, I've played lots of, as I say, lots of sort of straight up take that games, yeah. where the whole premise is, is to... Hurting the other players. Is hurting the other players. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. that's... But they are sort of advertised, and that's fine. But I guess I'm trying to think of games now. I mean, if we go back to Lewis and Clark. Yeah. And Lewis and Clark has this element where you, when you get resources, you don't only get resources from icons in your tableau, but icons on your player to your left and your right tableau. Mm -hmm. And that can be significant. And a strategy in Lewis and Clark can be to strike camp prematurely to deny other people leveraging your resources. Right, but would you do that just to deliberately deny the other players? Or would you do it because it's no. the right... Yeah, that's the thing. And this is the thing, right? I think I think if games bake in pure sort of hate, take that, if that's a term, mm -hmm. where you're only doing something to screw another player... I mean, people would argue, well, because you're knocking them back, you're sort of implicitly benefiting you, but... Which in a two-player game is fine. Right, yeah. but that's not how it feels, no. right? It's just not the way it is. It's not the way we work. You you expect people to do despicable things for at least a reason. Yeah. To be completely nihilistic and just do it for the sake of doing it is the definition of evil, right? So I, I can't think of any games offhand, but probably because I've wiped them from my memory. <laughs> because, I mean, I guess through the ages has an element of that. You can play rats which just screws the other people and kind of doesn't benefit you. Well, it hurts everybody. I mean, every time I play it, it ends up backfiring on me completely. All players lose right. all food. And then, I, and then I forget I've played it and I have like Yeah, well, this is the problem, right? But the promise is, <laughs> the promise is that you can, you can plan for it yeah. and you can just kick other people. And it affects all other players. And that's important. Yeah, and not really, not really benefit yourself. The only benefit you get is that you're able to plan in advance. Yeah. I, and when that was first played on me, because I didn't know that card was in the deck and I was playing with experienced players oh, and they okay. played it specifically. And when I was building up food, they didn't tell me that this was going to be a possibility. Right. When that card came up and I predicated my entire strategy on doing this thing that was going to kick an engine off to get me going and all of my food was removed so I couldn't build workers and I couldn't yeah. do this... I felt completely gypped. Right. I was lividly angry, but I don't think that is a fault that rests with the game. That's a fault that rests with the players not being generous yes. towards a new player. And right? as I say, that for me, any effect which affects all players or all other players is not a take that. Take that for me is in a, in a more than two player game, you are doing something that targets targets one other player. Anyway, what I'll do is I'll put this open to the guild. So if anybody's got anything they want to add on this discussion um, about Take That in games, and as uh, Ben has discussed, games that are absolutely advertised as Take That and you know what you're getting into and it's part of the game, that's absolutely fine. But it's when you're playing a game and it has an unexpected Take That element to it that I have seen firsthand in two games recently People now don't want to play that game because they thought it was a Euro game and they had this take that element in there. Right. Yeah, well, that's that thing. When people say, I don't like take that, they don't mean I don't like take that. What they mean is, I don't like being surprised by malicious actions by other players. Yeah. If they know it's going to be that kind of game, people tend to be perfectly happy yes. with it. Or not play the games, in my case. Right. Or don't play the game. Yeah. So the next discussion topic is downtime in games. And this has been inspired by a recent game which I got sent a copy of, Welcome to Centerville, by Chad Jensen, designer of um, a Dominant Species, which is an absolutely fantastic game, uh, and sent to me by GMT Games. Now, for some reason, uh, Chad Jensen wanted to send me a copy of, of this game, okay? And he spoke to GMT and said, hey, there's this guy in the UK, called Paul Grogan, and I like the stuff he does. Can you send him a copy of my latest game? So GMT sent me a copy of Welcome to Centerville mm. to my work address at the university that I left three and a half years ago. Nice. Thankfully, um, I didn't burn all my bridges there, and one of my former team contacted me and said, Hi, Paul, hope you're doing okay. A package has just arrived for you. And I'm like, what is this? Of course, at the time, I had no idea at all what it was. Um... And, and I opened it up and it was welcome to Centerville. Got in contact with Chad and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I asked them to send it to you. 
and it's a city building game and I quite like city building games. Now, I, I like the game, but it uses the Yahtzee mechanic for dice. So okay. on your turn, you roll the dice and then you can go, mm, right, I'm going to keep those ones and I'll re-roll these ones. And then you're like, oh, now I've rolled that. Right, well, I'll change my mind. And that one that I said I'd keep, actually, I've changed my mind of that. I'm going to re-roll that. Re right, roll again. Right, now I've, uh, my dice has set. I'll now take actions with my dice, okay? And the decisions that you have in the game, there's lots and lots of different things that you can do. So those decisions of which dice to roll are actually quite interesting. And they may change after your first roll and then again after your second roll. But the other players, whilst you're doing that, can do nothing. Right. There is zero planning that you can do in the game. There is zero in interaction between the players. You you have you are not actively involved in the game at all, and you cannot be involved in the game. There is nothing that you can do until it's your turn and you roll the dice. So that for me was a bit of a problem. And if you actually strip it down for, for, for the entire game, you are only actively playing about 30% of it. Assuming right. if you include setup and end game scoring, then or if you just chop out the actual gameplay part, you're only involved in 25% of the game. And that sounds terrible. It sounds the complete antithesis of games that I like. Yeah, but I played it three player and I didn't feel there was any downtime. And this is what confuses me, which is why I wanted to talk about it. There... So, so the way you've described it, it sounds like basically all downtime unless you're rolling the dice. Yeah. So how does this work? Um, because I was actually interested in what the other people were doing. And this, this is partly because I'm, I'm a rules person and I've taught them how to play and I want to make sure that they're playing correctly, which means actively watching what they're doing and, and taking part. Well, not taking part, but, you know, just, just watching and, you know... So for me, I didn't feel there was any downtime. But for the other players, they were like, literally, I, I can't do anything now. I can watch what you're doing, but I'm not having any input on the game whatsoever when it's not their turn. And I'm saying this as if it's a bad thing. The game, once you know the game, apparently you can play it in about an hour and a quarter. Mm -hmm. This isn't like a four-hour game. It, it does flow fairly quickly. And there is a couple of other people that I know who've played it and said, oh yeah, we played four players and we didn't feel there was any downtime. And I'm like, well, how can, I, you know, not wanting to deliberately argue with them, but how can you not feel there was any downtime when literally you can't do anything when it isn't your turn and there's four right. players in the game? So I, I, I need to speak to these people more because I'm, I'm, su I'm surprised by the fact that they didn't think there was downtime when actually there is, you know, the, the, you can demonstrate there is because of, the mechanics of the game. Now, the reason I dislike AP so much is because it robs me of activity. Right. I'm not able to do my stuff. So this is analysis paralysis for those people who don't know what AP is. People who take too long over their turns deciding things. And what that means is it's not the people or the AP but it's what it results in, which is downtime. Right. I hate downtime. Right. And part of the enjoyment I get from games is being able, when it's not my turn, to look at the board, plan my turn, off my turn, and then the excitement of thinking, ah, this turn, or maybe the turn after this turn, I'm going to do something that's really yeah. cool. And, and that anticipation... And that building up and then and then managing to just get that machine to work is just so rewarding, so much fun. This is why I couldn't abide Five Tribes. Right. Because in a multiplayer game, I hear it's not the same in a two-player game, but in a multiplayer game, the board state changes so much you from can't. your turn you to your next turn. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. Yeah. So I just have to sit there twiddling my thumbs, staring into the abyss, being reminded of you know, my eternal lack of talent while I'm waiting for other people to do their bits. And then when then I can start playing my turn. And I, I have the misfortune as well to play with some lovely people, but who are prone to taking time. Yeah. Even if they think in between turns, they still take a lot of time to resolve their turns. And so that increases that all the more. Yeah. And so, yeah. 
my ideal game, this is why I love Jamie Stegmaier so much, right? Because what he's really refined is the idea of the super quick turn. Mm -hmm. And lots and lots. Yeah, lots and lots of super quick turns. Scythe is this. Yeah. And what did I play the other day? Euphoria is mm-hmm. this. Charterstone is is really this. You know, your turn takes 20 seconds, boof, done, to the next one. But yeah. you have lots and lots and lots of them that sort of rapidly accrue and build up yep. this large strategy. And I really love that because it minimizes downtime completely, yeah. whereas this sounds the antithesis well, it, of what it, I Well, it like. surprised me because, you know, as you say, modern game design takes into account things like that. And the fact that in this game, it's like, right, it's your turn. You're doing everything. And nobody else can do anything. And then it's the next player's turn. It's very old school game design. Right. But I think you, you hit the nail on the head. And we'll just go back to talking about Through the Ages. In Through the Ages, in a three-player Through the Ages, and I'm not going to go four-player. I'll, I'll say in a three-player game of Through the Ages, the time it takes the other players to take their turns, for me, is about the time it takes me to work out what I'm going to do. Yeah. And most of the time, you can carry, un- unless somebody plays rats and loses all your food. And, and then suddenly you've got to rethink. So, for, so that's the big difference. So real downtime is where other players are taking their turn and there is absolutely nothing you can do. You can't even plan ahead. And, and most games yeah, these exactly. days have an element of planning ahead. This one doesn't. And Alien Frontiers came in for a similar criticism when it came out, is that when it's not your turn, you can't do anything. Because in Alien Frontiers, you only roll your dice at the start of your turn. Therefore, you can't plan ahead. Now, that's true. But in Alien Frontiers, I always had a rough idea. I was like, right, if I roll triples, I'm going to do that. And if I roll this, I'm going to go and get some fuel, and then I'm going to use the fuel on that. So... In my head, I have a very, very overall idea of what I kind of want to roll. And because you've got quite a lot of dice manipulation as well in Alien Frontiers, you can sort of have an idea. Then you roll your dice and you might get lucky and you might not. But at least I can have an an overall plan of, I sort of want to do this. Okay, this is Paul just interrupting myself. I'm currently editing the podcast and listening back to it. And I feel that I was possibly a little bit unfair with some of the things that I was saying about the game. Because when I was comparing it to Alien Frontiers and I was saying, oh, you can have a rough idea of what you want to do. You can also do that in Welcome to Centerville. So for example, there's an area control part of the game. um, And if I see that you've got three cubes in a particular area and I want to take control of that area, then I can go into my turn having in my mind, oh, if I roll these, then I'm going to put that in there. So yeah, I just I just wanted to add this in there. There is a little bit of planning that you can do when it's not your turn, just by saying, right, well, if I roll these dice, then I'm going to do that. If I don't roll these dice, then I do that. So yeah, just wanted to add that in there quickly. I mean, it's like worker placement games with limited spaces, right? Yep. Part of planning your turn is not just planning your turn, it's also planning the contingencies. Yes for someone taking what you wish to do. That's also part of it. Having an optimal and then a B and then a C. I mean, I find with me, my turns aren't what the turn is. My turns actually happen in between my turns, and my turn is actually just pressing the button and making the machine work. Okay. I mean, especially especially with Through the Ages is a great example. I plan in between other players' turns what I'm going to do. And all my turn is is just announcing what I've basically already done in my head. And the counters just track that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hire a worker, put the worker on the temple, do that, play this card. You know, as I say, you you can't plan entirely because the card row changes. Napoleon comes out and you go, oh, right, forget it. I'm going to spend three civil actions on buying Napoleon. Um so, yeah, you have to... I mean, my, my kind of ideal games are the kind of game... If we all had eidetic memories, that we could actually play without a board or components. <laughs> you know, that you could just say, I move my worker here, da 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 And it's all done sort of abstractly in the brain, and all the components do is just track what you've just done. Right. And, yeah, if I'm not able to do that off-turn, then I'm not playing a game, really. Okay. I'm just reacting to a situation, which is a different thing. Yeah. So lots of different types of downtime. There's downtime caused by the game design, which is the one that I'm talking about. There is downtime caused by slow players that w- wasn't the real... It wasn't what I was going to discuss. It is a thing. 
Um, but I'm interested, again, to hear from people on the guild. So if you have downtime in games because the other players are taking too long, I'm kind of not interested in that particular aspect of downtime. What I am interested in is games which exist and have downtime as an unavoidable consequence of the game design. And I'm also interested for those people who I have played, you know, things like Alien Frontiers or, or Welcome to Centerville or, or whatever, where there is very little planning that you can do, if you felt that there was downtime, or are you the kind of player that is so interested in what other people are doing, even though it doesn't directly affect you at all, are you interested enough that, you know, it keeps you interested in the, uh, in the game? So yeah, so that's, that's downtime. Anything else you want to add on that? No, I just think people who take too long to do their turns, get a grip of yourselves, <laughs> you're being selfish. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's wrap things up. Um, it's been good to talk to you. Uh, one quick plug again for your new show. Yeah, so my new show is Five Games for Doomsday. The first episode with Gil Hover, designer of the networks and host of Ludology, is already out there on iTunes. Search for Five Games for Doomsday. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm nearly at 100 followers, people. Get in. And that's five, the number, games, not a number. Four, the number, Doomsday, also not a number. And you can go to the website, Five Games for Doomsday. You can find us on BGG, on the Guild, and also on Facebook. And I really am tolerant to any form of abuse because <laughs> anything is human contact. So just say what you like. Yeah, and Five Games for Doomsday with the number five, and then that's your password for your bank account as well, isn't it? So Yeah, that's, that's and please take over my bank account <laughs> because that level of debt off my shoulders would be wild. <laughs> right, well, thank you very much for giving up your time and coming on the show again uh, and for all of the discussions. And as I say, anybody who wants to join in on the discussions, and let us know what you think, uh, then pop over to the BGG Guild. The link will be in the show notes of this video. Um, you can go on there and, yeah, tell us what you think. I'd recommend anyone coming over to the Gaming Rules Towers because they've got illicit substances in Shh. vending machines here. Shh. It's amazing. Don't tell anybody. So I hope you found the episode interesting. And as I said at the start, if you want to join in the discussion, head on over to Board Game Geek, Guild number 2258. The link is in the show notes. And you can carry on with the discussion there. Let me know what you think about downtime in games and also take that in games. So to wrap things up, just wanted to say thank you again to Games Law, the sponsors of the show at gameslaw.com and to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the music used in this podcast. Gaming Rules is a member of Punchboard Media, where we all bring something to the table, and a proud supporter of the Board Game Trading and Chat UK Facebook group. And you can support me on Patreon. The Patreon page is patreon.com slash gamingrules. Until next time, take care and thanks for listening.